purpose. So let's do a little bit of like what is NLP and what is the history of NLP and then we'll stop and save the rest of the notes for Saturday. So NLP is natural language processing. That is the purpose of this class, which we'll start with processing raw text, which is easily the most difficult thing we'll do. So we'll do the hardest thing first and then we'll learn how to build on that and do other really cool analyses after we know how to process them. I would say of the things that I have published that are more traditional NLP, this is always what takes me the longest. Like I'm avoiding one project right now because of this problem. <laughs> because it's slow. Okay, depending on how big the data set is, it can be very slow. But NLP itself has roots in computer science, obviously, artificial intelligence and linguistics. So it's like the merging of three or four different fields together. And I say also psychology, but psychology has a whole section of like psycholinguistics and cognitive sciences. And so that's what my degree is in, is cognitive science. Okay, my, what I tell people I do is computational linguistics because I don't ask many other questions. And if I'm feeling really um, like, please leave me alone, I tell them I'm a statistician because then they make that face like, oh, I hated that class. I'm like, great, I'm gonna go back to you leaving me alone then, right, on the plane. Um, but here our focus is going to be on human language and how to analyze language data. And this course focuses more on the traditional routes for NLP. So like parsing, um, the jingling is my dog's collar, she's pacing around. Um, so we're going to talk about parsing and um, part of speech tagging. <laughs> Sorry, it's distracting. Uh, parsing, part of speech tagging, classification, and sentiment. More traditional course stuff. Um, the other class I teach is Analytics 540. That's more about modeling, so that covers um, sort of traditional statistics applied to language and then like vector space models and neural net models, that kind of stuff. Okay, so these two courses are pretty different. Um, that's why they're not prereqs of each other. Okay, so we'll answer this question, like what is language? Right? More than its words, and how do we deal with something that is that messy? Right? It's unstructured data. So structuring it's the hard part. So just a like a little smash of a very brief origin of NLP. And um, I would say it really has it starts before the Turing test, but the Turing test is a big turning point in the history of NLP specifically. So there are other fields going on before this. Computer science is just starting because computers are now more, you know, accessible. Universities can own them. You know, they're as big as my house, but they're a thing. Um, there's linguistics, which has a very long, rich history. There's psychology, which also has a long, rich history. And we're starting to get this idea of artificial intelligence. And so that's where Turing comes in. And so we've argued about um, how can we take make a test that shows us something is intelligent, right, be it artificial. And so uh, a secondary part to that was a, a kind of a follow-up is the Chinese thought room experiment by Searle and they kind of, um, I mean, Turing isn't alive at this point, but Searle's kind of arguing about the nuances of Turing. Uh, the main gist here is if I am talking to a computer, so let's say a chat bot, Siri, whatever, and um, we're having a conversation. So I write something, it writes back. If I can't tell that that's a human or a computer, it would be considered intelligent. So when they have the Turing competition every year, people write machines that chat with humans. Sometimes they have humans chatting with humans, sometimes they have computers chatting with humans, and you vote at the end of your conversation. And computers that get X number of votes would be considered intelligent. I'm not sure anything has ever totally passed the Turing test, but some computers have gotten more than 50-50, right? They've gotten better than chance. Um, I would say that this is a hard thing to mimic because humans are so interesting in the way that they talk and can be creative, and most computer writing systems feel very jilted. Okay? Um, they don't totally make a lot of sense, but um, we'll talk about that more when we get into parsing. Like how could we write sentences back? Well, first we've got to know how a sentence is built. Moving on 
Georgetown experiment, this is a kind of a huge super big deal because they were tra machine translating. Now we think about Google Translate as just sort of like it's a thing, it happens all the time. And Google Translate is actually super fascinating. Spent some time reading about it. Uh, last semester, it's this crazy um, deep learning model that functions more efficiently than humans. So it's kind of it's really amazing if you're interested in machine translation that is a super interesting thing to read about. Um, but you know, in 1954, we're very interested in Russian as a as a country because of the Cold War, and so Georgetown produced a machine that could translate like 60 sentences. So think about how far we've come in 70 years, right? Um, NLP systems then suddenly started appearing because not only do now researchers have access to these machines like the military, um, the government, and academics, they can now start playing with these ideas. Right? So a couple of famous, two famous ones, I don't know how people pronounce this, but ELISA is a fairly famous um, early artificial intelligence tech machine built trying to do this idea. And essentially, if you talk to both of these guys at the time, they'd say, well, it doesn't really work. Now we can build much better machines, but I would still argue that nothing is like intelligent like humans, but there are machines that are very good. Right? Uh, so I literally was just like on Twitter um, before our class started about um, Amazon's like replace option. So there's this like a thing where you can, hey, I want to buy this. And if there is an alternative that can get to me faster, do that. And it was just like this whole Twitter thread of like what it replaced things with. And it's amazingly bad. And I would say Amazon has some of the best AI in existence because that's how they make their money, right? Amazon and Google and Facebook. Um, and so it was just amazing what it was replacing things with. Um, so if you want to look up Amazon replacements, that might get you to some of these like really funny moments in what is clearly not good AI, okay. um, which is what is clearly a very bad topic model. <laughs> and so after the 60s, this just took off. Right? I would say in the last 20 years, this has become very interesting because people like these like super fun catchphrases, right? So data science is a newer catchphrase. Um, uh, big data. Well, people love talking about big data, and I'm like, well, am I? Because what does that really mean? Um, uh, artificial intelligence has become really popular in the last 10 years. I think people get it a little better, even though it's been going on forever. Um, neural nets, deep learning. Everyone's super fascinated in deep learning right now. So, um, you know, the research kind of comes and goes, but there has been this huge explosion in research in this area given the fact that we're all holding, usually in our pockets, in our hands, faster, better computing power than people had five years ago or less, much less what they sent to people, sent people with to the moon, right? So um, the increases in computer technology along with the internet has really pushed NLP forward and has made it pretty popular. I'm partial though. <laughs> so um, some roots here in artificial intelligence. So that was first coined this term artificial intelligence in the 1950s. Um, but it's really kind of been studied for a long time. Okay. And I'd say it's not just, it's not really even computer science people who are interested in this now. It's like a vast, a large majority of people are just interested in this idea of can we program something that is intelligent? And I would argue this depends on our on our definition of intelligent. Right? I would say that driving directions are pretty damn intelligent. Like that is a complex task. Right? Um, but would I consider that human? I don't know. Right. So there's kind of this to me this disconnect of like when people say artificial intelligence, what they mean is things like in the movies where it's like it looks and acts and is human. Right. And what most people mean is it's a well-tuned algorithm to solve a problem that we don't want to deal with anymore. Right? So um, like the people who, who do the, the thing, um, met someone recently who handles, um, how do I explain this? 
uh, where do we send ambulances? So ambulances don't always sit at the hospital. Sometimes they sit in key locations that put them closer to where the normal action is. So there's a word for this. <laughs> it's an optimization task of like where do we deploy people and stuff. I don't remember the name. There's, there's a name for that whole field. But that idea of like creating an algorithm that best, you know, maximizes your, your efficiency. Um, and then you can learn a little bit more about AI in this link. So, and then the Turing test, um, a little bit more about this. So nobody really can refute that computers are very good at logic. Like that's their entire purpose. We humans are not good at logic, which is kind of amazing. Um, so can we, Turing was asking the question, can we determine what is thinking? Right? So there's, there's this disconnect I think between our idea of artificial intelligence as like things that can um, can do stuff really well for us and this idea of things that think like humans. I don't think we have things that think. I think we're uh, breathing creatures, animals, I mean animals clearly think. Um, that is very different than computer logic to me, my personal opinion. So that's what the Turing test was asking, like, are computers thinking? Um, and that really gets us down into, like, what do we determine is think? Um, and there is a lot of argument in this field. There's no argument that AI is important and useful. The argument over is the subtleties of what do we mean by that. So do we think that things that humans program <laughs> Right, that are zeros and ones that I type on. Do I ever think that that could think? And so there's tons of sci-fi about this because it's an interesting question. And so that would be a goal for AI research that is concerned with this question. I mean, a lot of people who do AI are really just concerned with optimization. That's a gross, gross simplification, but you know, as things get easier on humans, then we can think about programming them to like be ahead of us. Right? And then the matrix. But the whole idea starts with like, can we ever build a computer that's sufficiently enough like a human where we would basically say, well, if it acts like a human and talks like a human and thinks like a human, it might, we might as well consider it a human at that point. And so that's how the Turing test works, right? where a judge can't tell the difference. I think you'll learn more about the Turing test. So then, um, you know, that's an interesting question, but not wildly practical in the 50s. We were mostly dealing with the aftermath of World War II um, in the U.S., thinking about communism, etc. So baseball was the next kind of big academic program where it's um, kind of a question and answer. So where a lot of people started with this, can we build things that think, is like, what do humans do? Will we talk back and forth to each other? Well, can we program a computer that can talk back and forth? Clearly we kind of can. We have systems that will kind of do this. It's not great, but... Um, so baseball was this computer program that they had reading punch cards, how old this is. And essentially there were facts about baseball, that's why it's called baseball. And you would put in your question and it would read the words and look them up in the dictionary and think about phrase structure. So a lot of things we'll learn this semester. And kind of do this like early version of what we might call topics analysis now or content analysis. And you know, take in the information requested and spit out some information back. Okay, so it would match something to the database and spit it back out. The newest form of this would be Watson, okay, who takes in all this information, searches, and finds the answer. And so the context was over baseball games. So where did each team play on July the 7th? So these are very easy dictionary lookup questions. This is something you can do easily with Google now. Um, but it's a start because this is the 1960s and we don't have that kind of idea just yet. Google is not even born. 
Uh, then Eliza. Now Eliza was one that was meant to be a human interaction, right? So it's an early NLP program, 1960s at MIT. A lot of this came out of MIT. A lot of stuff still comes out of MIT. They have um, a leading artificial intelligence lab by, um, from Joseph Weizenbaum. And his goal in creating Eliza was to show that um, the best we could do with interacting with machines was very superficial. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How's the weather? It's great, thanks. Like the conversation that you have with your mom when you're not really listening, right? Um, and so it simulated a conversation with the user by using a lot of pattern matching and substitution. So it would take your sentence back, kind of parrot the same kind of basic topic back at you. And so his purpose was to show like, this is very, you know, we can't really do this and here's how superficial it is. But unbeknownst to him, the, you know, he would talk to his grad student or his secretary about this project and essentially they'd be like, but it's clearly talking to me or like it has feelings like, oh, well, you know, it understood what I was feeling or it, it you know, here's some emotion in this. And he's like, no, <laughs> this is pattern matching. This is not emotion. And so it kind of showed more about the users than it did about the machine, right? The machine could work and the, but the, we as humans like to attribute human like attributes to non-human things, right? This is why everyone talks to their dogs <laughs> and their cats, you know? Um, and we all like to humanize things. And so this experiment really told him more about people than it did about computers, but also a lot about how you would program this type of machine. And this is where a lot of regular expressions came from, which is one thing we'll learn in a couple weeks. So last, let's talk about this other system that was um, very famous which I don't even remember what it stands for. Let's see, let's Google it. Google. It's gotta stand for something. Uh, the, oh, arrangement of letter keys on a line of type machine. Got it. Okay. I never am like sure how to pronounce this, but uh, there we go. It's the, it's like calling it a QWERTY, right? So, uh, also written by MIT people, okay, a little bit after the ELISA experiment. And what it would do is, much like the baseball cards, would um, show you some objects on the screen and would chat with you about the objects on the screen. Okay. And um, I thought I had more on the slide, but essentially it showed the same basic idea. Like we could program machines, this is a, a concept, we can program machines to communicate okay. and people can attribute emotions to those machines but they would never really tell you that it was human right so they say like well this seems human like but i know it's not because it's really awkward or it's really um poor at communicating okay. and so think about like that concept to what we have now right so we have computer games like things from like blizzard right that are um doing this sort of thing at a much more amazing level. We have things like Siri and OK Google and um, uh, Watson that have taken this concept and really like expanded it to levels that are amazing, but still there's something, right? So we're going to talk a lot about like words and how people are when they're using language. And when we analyze language, what we can get, like what we can understand about the not only the, the words on the page, but about the user, right? We have to understand how humans are to under, process text because it's created by humans. And I think you'll see why these machines have an upper limit at the moment. Um, so I'm gonna continue this from, from last time. So why should we even study NLP? Like why are we even all here in this classroom other than it's a class, right? So, 80% of big data is unstructured data, and that comes from the NLTK book. And so I don't know if that's still true, because I feel like the internet maybe is better at metadata now, but the basic idea behind this is that so much of the data that we 
want to consume or are interested in is unstructured data, right? So give me actually two seconds. It's not one moment. All this uh, pollen from it warming up and my nose run. All right. So lots of data is unstructured. So we really need to figure out how to um, how to structure it. And so we have things like images, videos, uh, human language is the part we're interested in. So text, recordings. We're not even going to cover sound, but sound is a whole nother layer of complexity to um, the types of analyses that we're interested in. Um, we could be told just interested in text mining. So a lot of times people, when they say text analytics or sentiment analysis, they're talking about the bigger set of NLP processes. So we could take, um, take these text pieces. So let's say we're interested in the, the <clears throat> tweets that are going on about COVID, because there's just bound to be millions at this point, right? That would require us first to understand how to process that text, which is what next week's lecture will cover, um, but also what to do with it, right? So how do we derive information from that? And we're going to take kind of the path through a traditional NLP kinds of topics to be able to get to our final like, classification techniques. So traditional approaches to text analytics include a lot of semantics. Right? We're interested in meaning. What does this mean? Is it positive? Is it negative? How do I group it into categories? That kind of thing. So that's globally kind of called semantics. Um, so early research might have been on readability. So there are a whole set of statistics that um, can tell you how readable something is. This is kind of how Grammarly works. Um, <clears throat> they look at common phrases that maybe we should avoid to help uh, clarity of meaning. We can look at like interest indices. So can we predict how popular a book is going to be based on other um, text pieces from, from those books, right? So uh, reviews and ratings. And then a lot of people, especially at the like lower education levels, are very interested in a vocabulary. So this might be what lexicon is important for each group of people. So are we uh, in the U.S. talking about this virus stuff? I mean, just as a recent example, are we talking about that the same way that they were talking about it in Italy, right, or in Europe, or even in China? So kind of thinking about, um, oh, do we have different vocabularies? And I would say for a while we did. <laughs> um, and how has that vocabulary shifted during all of this? And the most important thing that you'll see across the semester is that if you don't know the answer, the answer is frequency. Okay. Frequency of occurrence, frequency of co-occurrence, how likely they are to occur together versus in separate documents. Um, we're going to use that idea of frequency to do almost everything this semester. So for part of speech tagging, some words have multiple parts of speech. Sometimes they're a verb, sometimes they're a noun. Right? And how do you pick which one it is to tag? For word frequency, which one is the more common option is the best choice sometimes. Uh, we can use things like factor or cluster analyses to help us understand that kind of thing. We can make those cute word clouds that everybody loves. Um, and then we can just think about like how long something is. Um, so frequency is a huge predictor and is a very useful piece of information for nearly every NLP task. So what are we going to do this semester? Well, first chapter is going to be over learning how to process raw text. And this is going to be a lot because if you have no Python experience, um, I'll try my best to introduce you softly into Python, but it, it, we're going to do a lot of like, here's the R version, here's the Python version, here's the R version, here's the Python version. So there, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in this chapter, but we're going to use it all semester. Okay, so I would say when people struggle, this is the chapter 
that, that is the hard one because it's um, kind of just to toss you in um, head first to the deep end to use an American phrase um, but we're just gonna jump right in so to speak why are these all pool examples um we're gonna off to the races or it's as many slang phrases as I can come up with right now right um, <clears throat> next chapter we'll learn how to tag for parts of speech and this is a really useful task for a lot of, of the processes that come after that such as parsing and performing entity recognition named entity recognition is where you add labels like Apple big a Apple is a company versus little a Apple is a noun so you have to know the part of speech to do that then we'll get into dependency parsing which will help us understand how items relate to each other in a sentence think about classification so learn how to classify using text as our predictor and end with sentiment analysis because sentiment analysis is um, is a special type of classification that has some extra components to it and this class used to be called sentiment analytics and I have no idea why because you cannot do 16 weeks of sentiment but uh, it is a very popular task but I want to dispel the myth that is the only thing that people do with text analytics okay. it's really popular but it's not the only thing we do all right question are we gonna use spacey oh yeah we're gonna use spacey through all of this mostly here I can't can I highlight it it's mm, being rude mostly here okay. once we get down to classification not so much on spacey but lots of spacey yeah <clears throat> find my soda while you type Yes, but it also does dependency parsing and named entity recognition. So we'll use it for part of speech and for lots of other things. Okay, so some, some terminology. So we're going to use computers to process human language. Right? Um, and that's kind of, I feel like natural language processing is like this big title for everything that people do computer wise with uh, text right computational linguistics which is what I would say my background is is thinking about language through a computational or computer science focus right I'm a, also a statistician so I think about language and its statistics machine learning is where we're going to use an algorithm right? like logistic regression or naive base to help us uh, help train a machine to do the task right so it's called machine learning for a reason we the machine learns I always think of it as more like it trains right? um, because learning is such an interesting term for humans it's a pretty different task but we might use machine learning to classify or process text information retrieval is another part of this where we think um, this is kind of like Watson or Google right so looking up uh, based on a query so if I said um, you know uh, how many people were tweeting about uh, the virus today that would be a query that then required me to go and pull that information from Twitter so to speak another term to know would be corpus okay we're gonna use a lot of corpora which is the plural term for corpus that is where we'll have um, <clears throat> a lot of text so a corpus is a body of linguistic data and I actually have a website where I like keep track of all these different corpora um, but a very popular one is COCA which is the corpus of contemporary American English which allows you to search for particular words but we're going to use corpora in a more flexible way uh, let's look at my favorite word which is easily cheese and in this particular corpus which is about I don't even know how many words now it's uh, 36,000 times and the other cool thing is you can like click on it and you can see where people are using it from so I can find the context of cheese right are people using it as a noun to mean the literal food thing or are people using it as um, here, Chuck E. Cheese. 
a, still a noun, it's a proper noun. Okay. And so you can see what kind of data they have over here. The entire website, EnglishCorpora.org, has even more of them. Okay. Many of these are in English, but there are places where we can find ones that aren't. Okay. So I know many of you speak other languages, and there are definitely other corpora in other languages out there. Um, oh, for COCA, good question. Great question. Let's see. The corpus of contemporary American English is mostly internet and news and, let's see, one billion words. There's a way to view, like, their sources. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Overview? That's the page one. Queries? No, that's how you do it. So there's somewhere on here that it tells you what sources they are. But let's see. Because if I click here, it takes me to this. Uh, maybe just down here. <clears throat> One billion words of text, 20 million from year from 1990 to 2019. So clearly we've got some non-internet sources from spoken fiction, popular magazines, newspapers, academic texts, and now with blogs, web pages, TV, and movie subtitles. So the subtitle corpora, um, no problem, are very popular. We'll talk about the subtitle ones kind of off and on. Um, but I use those in my own research. Okay. And there's actually a Python package for them, which is really excellent. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, great, I know Python now. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so what can we do with a corpus? Okay. Lots of stuff. Right? I can use it as a training document if it has tags to create taggers or stimmers. So I can use it to as a machine learning data set. Right? So for part of speech tagging or stimming, which is where you cut off the um, affixes on a word, like stimming would turn into stem because you drop off the I and G. Uh, limitization, which is where you translate the word back into its root, like a dictionary lookup. So we have things like WordNet for that. Uh, learning how to make a grammar and understanding the roles of words. Okay. So corpora are very handy for answering those types of questions, but they're also very useful in answering uh, topic related questions. So I can use them in almost any tasks that I'm interested in. And any data set that you make that you're using for your analysis can be considered a corpus. Okay. There are some that are like labeled, like big C corpus, like these have official labels. Okay. And the most popular one is the brown corpus. Okay. I make fun of it as the most overused corpus. I've used it a lot in my own work. And it was published in a book. It has text in about five or six different categories and maybe more than that. But it's very popular for part of speech taggers, and we'll use it, and I'll show you how it works. Um, but it's from the 1960s, and that's been quite a while now, so um, people are moving away from it because it's just not relevant anymore. Right? Language has changed a lot since then. Okay. The LOB corpus is the British answer to the Brown corpus. There's the Child's and Talk Bank corpora that are um, updated frequently for children's speech because that's pretty different than uh, adult speech. WordNet is one we'll use, and it's a, a lexical database that's hierarchically structured, so it's very good for understanding nouns and adjectives and some adverbs and verbs. It is not so good at understanding language as a whole because there are many pieces that don't fit there. Um, but it allows us to do some cool stuff. Uh, TreeBank is really neat because TreeBank is now in so many languages. But it's a it's the kind of answer to the newer version of Brown right, for part of speech tagging. Okay. Reuters is a news corpus that's very popular for machine learning. Right, a and C and B and C are the American and national uh, British national corpus, which is now part of the contemporary American English corpus. And then what is easily the largest one of all is Google's in grand corpus. Right? So many words. Do I have more? Yeah. 
So then the web, chat, tweet, email one. So there are many data sets hosted on Kaggle that are very popular. There's an Amazon sentiment one. There's the famous IMDb movie reviews one. Um, there's a Yelp and Twitter sentiment corpus. Technically, we can consider movies corpora, so there's subtitles. There's tons of stuff out there. These are just some of the most popular ones. All right, so a couple things to know. I'm just going to give you some kind of like examples of things that we might try to do. So a token is an individual word in text. And so tokens is the total number of words. But we repeat words a lot, especially determinants, the and a, prepositions of, in, um, <clears throat> those kinds of things. So sometimes instead it's better to count types. Okay, so types are the number of distinct words or distinct tokens. And you can think about a types to token ratio, which is sometimes called lexical diversity. So how many unique words are you using in the text? Now, frequency distribution wise is so we can make this cool picture. So I did this based on the Arling library um, that has a part of the English lexicon project in it. And this is just a frequency count of some of the most popular words in the English Lexicon Project based on their version of it. Because the, the ELP uh, actually has 80,000 words in it, and this uh, data set has like a 800 in it, and I only printed 100, so it was readable. So I can make these frequency distributions of them, and I won't go over the code just a whole lot because there's a lot of ways to make these kind of plots, like histogram plot essentially. Um, and you won't have to do this in any of your assignments, I just kind of want to show you something. Um, this curve here is called Zip's Law. Okay, Zip's Law, it's like zip with a F on the end, <laughs> because it's German, is this idea that the most frequent word is way more frequent than the next frequent word, which is more frequent than the next one, um, by halves. So if we look at the frequency of words, we almost always get this like power law function, this exponential. I think this is one over x this way, um, where uh, we get like super frequent and then it all tails off and we have this like long tail of infrequent words. Okay. You can tell this is not real, like complete English because the first word in the English language is the most popular is the. All right, the other thing I did here was load the reticulate library and um, load a Python. So you can see kind of what my Python did here. And then as we go throughout the semester, now that we're using code chunks, at the top of each code chunk, I will put in if it's R or if it's Python, because even though I have it here in the background as the slides, you can open these. So let's see here. Right? <clears throat> So here I should put echo equals false and uh, message equals false, so it doesn't print out those notes. But each one you'll see, I you can see that it's either R or Python down here. But once you knit those together, it um, you can't unless you're good at the languages, you can't tell the difference. So on the top of each one, I have what it is so that you can know which language that's in. Okay. And as you go through the semester, hopefully that will kind of ease itself out because you'll understand that library means it's R and import means it's Python. All right, so for example, here, import. This is Python code for library, right? This allows us to open a particular package. Okay? We're importing it into our working space. This here allows us to import specific things. Okay? So we don't have to import the entire NLTK book, although it does open most of them without me telling it to. Um, I can import only text for. So this is kind of like importing a variable or importing a function to a specific package only. All right, I'm going to make a dispersion plot down here. And the NLTK package has these really, like, it makes it easy to do, as long as you have a text. And a dispersion plot is a frequency diagram on its side. So what we see here is that across the bottom here, this is the count of the words. Word zero, word one, word two, word three, word four. And then here are the words that we picked. 
So the way I ran this code was it a text for, this is Python, so text for here, you can see, is the inaugural address corpus. I think it's up to Obama the first time. It's not completely updated. Um, and so what it is, is it's just a list of all of the inaugural addresses. So on text four, I want to create this plot. Now in R, we spend a lot of time doing like function and then arguments. Python's a little hit and miss with this, where it's like, here's the thing I want you to apply this function to. So I want to on text for dot apply dispersion plot. So one thing about the difference to get kind of used to switching back and forth is that R like pretty much never does this, right? You have argument and then we would do text for, you know, do this function on what? Python does this a lot, or it's like the function itself, I'm sorry, the 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 data set or the text or the, the variable, that's the word I'm looking for apply this function dispersion plot and do that dispersion plot on these uh, text labels so what we get here is citizens democracy freedom duties in america and this is like a time series plot of those words okay it's a time across across the text because they're just all kind of stacked together one at a time but it's also across um literal time because these are um, inaugural addresses so every four years. What we can see is that citizens was very popular early on and then kind of dies out. Democracy becomes much more interesting later in life and I think these are kind of during wars is what we see. Freedom becomes very important also later so these kind of map together. Um, freedom of speech but also freedom like American freedom so uh, wartime stuff duty like duty to one's country duties as a citizen that just pretty much disappears but then surprisingly not too surprisingly i guess america becomes much more popular uh later and i think it would be even more now if we had trump speeches in here because of his campaign slogans another term we might think of is collocates so you can look at google's ingram viewer a collocate is a sequence of words, so pairs, triplets, whatever. And so in this uh, picture here, what I have is a linguistic, which is not very frequent as a word. It only kind of becomes a research field, so to speak, over here. Uh, natural language and processing, which clearly has this big bump during the time in which computers became affordable for uh, households to buy. So what we see is that um, the word natural has kind of like declined over time, but language has become much more interesting. Uh, now, none of these are paired up together, so let's try that. Okay, that was each word one at a time. And so the default is Einstein, Sherlock Holmes, and Frankenstein. Up to 2012. So let's actually increase that over here. Let's see what we get. And then they all drop off because that data set apparently only runs up to 2008. But let's do all the words at once. Natural language. Let's compare that to just language, shall we? So language, much, much more popular. Okay, this clearly only goes to 2008. Much more popular as a term. Natural language doesn't even make a blip, right? But if we take off language, let's see what's happening with natural language here. And what you also can kind of see is that spike that came around the same time as computers. So let's do all three now. Okay. That's a two gram or a bigram. This is a trigram, three at once. And it really, this is like when this field took off. And so those collectively are called collocates, um, where we're understanding the collocation of words is the idea. So what can we compute? Right? Well, we can do some basic statistics, frequency, counts, right? frequency of the characters, frequency of the words, sentences, etc. Lexical diversity, which is a types to token ratio. 
So how unique are the words that people are using? Um, lexical dispersion, which is a position of the words in the text. We looked at one of those graphs a second ago. We can think about word sense disambiguation. This helps people understand context better. So the idea is like which version of the word is it given a context? Right? What's the definition I should be understanding here? And that might be really useful for children right? who don't, or people who are learning to read, or second language learners right? who maybe only know one version of the word. And so they get to it and they're like, this doesn't make any sense here. And so it could be like, well, the context here implies that this word is actually what? So for example, serve, there's a couple here, serve can help mean to help with food or drink. Like a waitress could serve you. It could mean hold an office. It could mean serve one's military in, in English versions. It could mean serve like a tennis. So I could use context around that to help me determine. Dish here could be the literal plate you eat off of. It could be the course of the meal or maybe not as much anymore, but like dish TV. Contextual clues. Um, so for example, here's three. The children, the lost children were found by the searchers. So we're looking at this phrase, um, um, the preposition phrase here, how that changes the context of the sentence. So lost children found by the searchers, that's an agent. The searchers are finding the children. Found by the mountain, that's a location. So found is a spot. Uh, found by the afternoon, now found is a time. Okay, so these all are modifying that uh, verb found. You can think about pronoun resolution. This is like my favorite thing to torture my better half with of like, he just says it and he all the time. Like I'm gonna know who that is, right? So pronouns are things I, you, we, she, he, it, they. And they can make a text very ambiguous. How do I know which one is that referring to? Like some writers use this as a way to build suspense. I don't know who he is, right? And I'm gonna figure out who he is later. Um, but when reading, it helps if we can understand who something is. And that noun is often called the antecedent because it's usually before it. You usually give people a clue before it, which it, it is. So let me give you some examples. The thieves stole the paintings. They were interested here in what they refers to. They were subsequently sold. Okay. So, easy enough. Paintings get sold, not thieves. Okay. The thieves sold paintings. They were subsequently caught, caught, caught. Now we catch thieves. And then a truly ambiguous one, they were subsequently found because we could find the thieves or we could find the paintings. So we don't know who they is in that sense. We can also generate output. So I think in one of, well, that might be the other class, but um, I was talking recently to another instructor who teaches this class about um, that meme that was going around for a while that was like, I trained a bot on all of James Joyce and it had it write a new novel or whatever, this ridiculous thing that was going on Twitter. Um, and you can do that with some deep learning techniques where you can train models on specific phrasal structures and then have it generate output. Okay, it's hilariously bad. Um, so he was trying to train it on um, like police commentary, but he was he started by training it on Batman, which I thought was funny. I've tried to do it a little bit with like Alice in Wonderland and it's just terrible. Like oh, it's just so impossible. You can't um, without a lot of training examples. Um, it's kind of funny to put together. Yes, exactly. And that's exactly why. So um, by training some of these models, what you're doing is teaching them patterns, patterns of things that tend to go together. And humans certainly use patterns, but um, we're also very creative. And so it, it, those models don't capture creativity. Although they do have a, a, an element of randomness in them, it tends to not work in a way that it makes it clear it's uh, machine rather than human because the randomness is like nobody would say that yeah. so you have an excellent point there creativity is the problem we can't quite um 
program that in computers just yet. Uh, but those systems are useful for answering questions by Google and Watson. Okay. Or, um, so who sold the paintings in our previous example? Uh, we can do lots of machine translation, and I swear to you, you should go and read. I feel like I talked about this. I also have four classes this week, so I'm not sure who I told this story to, but you should read about Google's um, translation system. I don't know what to Google here. Google Translate. There's like some blogs on um, how they did this. Uh, let's say Google Translate. Let's do deep learning because that's what I was talking about in my other class. Um, that explains Google's algorithm. And not like really, but like it's kind of, it's from the Google blog. I'll see if I can find it later. Um, but they have this machine translation system that is just like amazingly crazy. And um, it does what's called zero shot translation. So most translation is at least one shot, meaning if I'm trying to go from English to Japanese, and it's never seen English to Japanese before, it has to hit a middle road first. Okay, I can, I know Chinese to Japanese, so I'm gonna go English to Chinese to Japanese. Okay, they're called a one-shot translation. Um, Zero-shot translation is I could, tr I could give it a pair of words it's never, a pair of languages it's never seen before, and it can figure it out based on patterns. Okay. That's a totally blew my mind, because humans can't do this. So they've written this program, this deep learning program, that can do something that humans are actually quite terrible at. We're very bad at that kind of generalization. Okay. This is why professional athletes play one sport and not all of them. Okay. So we're very good at ga gaining um, expertise and tasks. But uh, if I asked some of you who speak multiple languages to pick a new one and just tell me the words in the new one, you'd look at me like I was crazy, right? <laughs> So it's really very, very cool um, that it can do that. All right, so translating from one language to another. Uh, however, it's not perfect. It is an amazing system, but it's not perfect. So my favorite thing sometimes to do is uh, search Google Translate fails, because they're funny. We can also write spoken dialogue systems. So this is the phone stuff where you're like, it's like press one for, you know, or hey, tell me what your problem is. And then it's like beep, boop, beep, boop, beep, boop, boop. Okay, you want billing. Um, Siri, Google, etc. And this is taken from the NLTK book and I think just really personifies, um, I don't think I can make it smaller. Maybe I can get the whole thing here. Um, the entire process. So this is like the NLP process. And people can spend their entire careers focusing on one part of it. Me, here, right? This is what I do. Um, and so if we're building systems, we're, we're going to focus a lot on these top levels. But I want you to understand that that means that I can then do these bottom levels. So let's say we're trying to write a speech system that responds text-to-speech, for example. Okay. First thing you do is anal an analysis it, <laughs> analyze the text. The speech. That means breaking it down into its morphemes and its, its lexemes, right? So knowing that they said dogs plural, which means that we're talking about multiple dogs. Breaking that into parsing units, so the sentence structure. What sent does that sentence structure imply reasoning wise? Like what is the context, the meaning of it? A higher order thinking, like okay, it asked me a question, right? So uh, why are beagles so loud? Well, mine's asleep dreaming right now, but you know, why are they so loud when they bark? I gotta reason that out. Okay. Um, utterance planning, let's say we're responding back now. Utterance planning is when you're planning a response based on the meaning of what the reasoning was. Syntactic realization is putting that in a grammatically correct sentence. Morphological realization, subject verb matching, tense matching, that kind of stuff. And then literally saying it back. So we do all this without thinking. Okay, we are thinking, but we do all this without awareness. Okay, until you run into a word you can't remember correctly, right? Um, and so we, to program this, we have to, what we're going to do is focus on little individual parts, 
but understand that NLP can also be these huge systems that do all of these parts. Okay, so Spacey is a system that does a lot of these parts. I don't think it really, um, I don't know if people use it for reasoning, but they have some other cool AI products called like Prodigy is one that is supposed to do more of this stuff. Uh, last couple slides here. So we can also think about our statements true or false. Okay. So um, uh, like, oh, it's going to rain today. So, you know, kind of given that all of sports betting is shut down, that's so why better half was telling me a story that one of someone he knows who knows someone else who loves to sports bet is now betting on the weather because there's no sports to bet on. And that's the kind of thing that textual entailment could help us do, right? Not bet on the weather, but this idea of like, is something accurate or not? Okay, so one example, this person is the editor of all these books. If I ask this question, um, this person has written 18 books. Could you write a system that could say, yes, that's true, or no, that's false based on this input? Okay. This is a lot of what Watson does too. Um, that's why it was able to win at Jeopardy, right? <laughs> So some final thoughts before we jump into our computer setup here. Uh, we covered the basic concepts of NLP. I just give you some examples of terms that you're going to see and then the order of the class for the semester. Okay. Um, thinking a little bit about how these basic concepts, that structure, if I can teach you the structure of NLP and the basic um, ins and outs, what then can you do with it? Okay, so we'll talk a lot about applications. So why should I learn how to process raw text? Well, one, because garbage in, garbage out. I have that cool poster on the wall here. Um, but also uh, because if you can process the text, then you can know what your analysis is actually telling you. 